Good afternoon. I'm Ann Sumner, Vice President and Head of Operations for Baker Boyer Bank's Asset Management Division. Our employees and our clients have been asking a lot of questions about COVID. And although most of my career has been spent in healthcare, I am not qualified to answer those questions. But we had a unique opportunity today to speak with two gentlemen who are more than qualified to have a conversation about COVID, Dr. Tony Billingsley and Dr. William Fagey. Dr. Billingsley grew up here in Walla Walla. He completed his undergraduate work at Whitworth College and then went to medical school and did his emergency residency at University of Washington. He's been at our St. Mary's here in Walla Walla since 2005. He's an attending physician in the emergency department and is also the hospital chief of staff and the assistant ER medical director. He is a busy man and we are grateful for his time. He's been married 23 years and has four children. Dr. Fagey joined us today from Atlanta, Georgia. He is another graduate of UW School of Medicine, although many years before Tony. He's a physician and an epidemiologist renowned for his work in global health. He was instrumental in the eradication of smallpox. He has served as the director of CDC. He uh, co-founded the Task Force for Child Survival. He's been the senior medical advisor and senior fellow at the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Among many other things, you can Google him, um, William Fahey. He's received numerous honorary degrees and awards, including the Presidential Medal of Freedom. His parents lived here in Walla Walla in the 50s, 60s, and 70s, and he still has a sister living here in town who happens to be my mom. So he is my uncle, and you'll see that throughout the conversation he he weaves that in here and there. So we are very, very grateful for their time and hope that you find this conversation helpful. So, and your first question was about why the, uh, the uh, distance. And let me just say a word about it, then ask Tony to enlarge on it. It is not an exact science. And that uh, when you see the pictures of what happens with droplets, most of them do fall very quickly. But as with smallpox, we thought the same thing. And I used to say, if you can vaccinate anyone within six feet of a, pa of a uh, patient with smallpox, you're going to get everybody you need to get. And that's basically true. But the irony is sometimes you get airborne spread. And the very last outbreak of smallpox in the world, after it was extinguished every place, took place in England when in a lab where they were working on smallpox virus, they had a window open, virus got sucked out of that window, up a story into a window of the photographer, medical photographer, she got smallpox. Wow. So it wasn't a droplet at all. She gave it to her mother. They were both in the hospital. Her father came to visit them, had a heart attack and died in the hall. I mean, the whole thing was such a disaster. My whole point is, it's not an exact science, but it's like N95 masks. You still have 5% of the particles getting through, and yet everyone considers that safe. So six feet is basically good, but it's not exact. Tony, does that sound reasonable to you? It does, and I think that's some of the same things that we're seeing is this debate back and forth on whether this is truly droplet spread only, or is there an airborne, or airborne component to it? And, you know, you see CDC guidelines saying one thing and WHO guidelines saying one thing and feels like as providers on the front line that, you know, every 24 hours, the guidance changes on it. Yeah. And it's probably for reasons exactly like what you just mentioned, where, yes, it's primarily droplet spread, but there can be an airborne component to it as well, depending on the scenario plus all the touching of places. And when I was in graduate school, they added a fluorescent dye to polio virus to do a demonstration for us. And it was astounding how fast with the dark light, you could start picking up this virus all over the room and on handles and, and so forth. So um, how many cases have you had in Walla Walla? Uh, I think our current uh, total is 12 in our county. We're, we're in a little bit of a, uh, a different situation because we're right on the state line. And so our 
the states get a little bit tangled up, you know, but the virus doesn't really care much about state borders. And so our service area is definitely seen more than that, um, but not dramatically more. We're still on this, you know, every day is uh, one or two new cases kind of on that same, on that same trend. Do you have enough protective gear? We do. I mean, for the time being, um, uh, as far as uh, the hospital goes, we're still, we're definitely in conservation mode. And, uh, you know, all of our elective surgeries have been canceled partly to, um, to conserve our PPE. And we're definitely very, um, very cognizant of every single piece that we use. Uh, we have changed a lot of the flow of patients through the hospital and through the departments to minimize uh, that first, those first points of contact when you really need all the PPE. And then you can kind of determine as the patient moves through the system, are they somebody you need to continue to have PPE with throughout their entire encounter? Or are they there for a sprained ankle and they don't have any other you know, symptoms that would put them at risk, in which case you can conserve and not use PPE on those patients. Uh, so within our hospital, there's that. We've actually started um, reprocessing masks. So we contract with a company that um, any mask at the end of our, and at the end of when we're done using it, we put it in a specific uh, receptacle and it's processed and cleaned and tested. And so we're starting to see some of those um, reprocessed masks coming back into circulation. Um, I think countywide PPE is a different is a different story, and I know a number of our first responders, a number of our uh, EMS crews and medics, uh, law enforcement, it, it's more challenging for them. Uh, and so there's been a locally there's been an amazing response of people donating supplies, and I get I get messages every single day from people saying, hey, I have, I found some supplies or somebody gave me some or gosh, I was in my shop and I was sanding and I found a whole box of N95 masks. This is what you oh, guys wow. need. And so there's been a lot of that that's been really, really helpful for the county as a whole. And uh, do you handle many patients without seeing them at all, just over the phone, keeping them home? So, um, so we, uh, Providence, you know, our parent company, which has a whole bunch of hospitals and we're one of them, has really gone full bore into telemedicine. Um, we've already been involved in it leading up to this, but, but with this, it's just been um, really upscaled. And so uh, there are ways that people can get enrolled in that. Um, and so all of their care is virtual. Uh, we, in the, in the emergency department, um, Obviously, we're still seeing patients, although I, I will oftentimes actually see somebody on one side of the door and talk to them on the phone and, um, you know, have a single visit into that room and all the follow-up discussions that I would normally have right at the bedside with them, now over the phone looking at them through the glass. So it's a little bit different in that sense. Um, our... Our urgent care has a drive-through clinic for screening and testing, uh, and so that sort of, you know, keeps that barrier there for the most part. Uh, but yeah, the telemedicine component has been has been really, really huge. I know here and obviously nationally as well. You know, this is going to change everything and how we do distance learning. I was asking my intern this, this morning uh, because he's doing a lot of telemedicine. Are they? putting the, uh, the O2 monitors for the finger in the home so that they get one more reading on something that may be going wrong. And he said they've done a lot of discussing on that, but they haven't done it. And I looked at the, on the internet and you can buy them for $50, so it's not prohibitive. Would this be a reasonable thing to be using? Yeah, so in our situation, what we do is um, if somebody comes in and if, if somebody comes in and they have very mild, mild symptoms, we might screen them and send them home and, and you know, it's just phone follow up. In somebody who's, who's a little bit more sick but doesn't need to be hospitalized, we actually have kits that we give them that's a thermometer and a pulse oximeter and we enroll them in our telehealth monitoring and a provider will basically contact them, I think it's twice a day 
for a number of days and get their get their sats and get their uh, temperature and, and that helps determine are they still safe to stay at home do they need to actually come back into the hospital uh, for care so yeah we've given away I don't know how many but quite a few of those so you're ahead of Emory <laughs> the bigger movement has moved away I don't know if we were ever in containment phase but we're definitely mitigating um, what would get us back to the point where we would be in a containment phase versus mitigation? It, it's, it's a good question because it's clear that we missed the boat at first with the uh, lack of, of testing. And I think one of the things that we should be looking at now is could we in fact open the spigot slowly by identifying everyone that has antibodies, giving them a, an identification card with their picture on it that says when they were tested, how they were tested, and they could go back to work with no harm to them or to anyone else. It would be a way of putting thousands of people back to work every week with no danger to, to anyone else. And I don't know that anyone has actually done this but it's also reasonable. If we got to the point where we see a decline on the curve, I think we should be going all out for containment again. And people reject that idea because they don't see it as plausible. We just don't have the staff. We don't have the, well, if we had thousands of people ready to go back into the workforce, you could hire them to do that. They would immediately have jobs. And when people, say it's too big a job, we can't do it. They've not had the experiences we had in, in India. In, with smallpox in May of 1974, we were having 1,500 new cases of smallpox every day in one state. And people said it's too big a job, we cannot do containment on this. We didn't have computers and we just kept hiring people and pushing them. We had 100,000 people working just as watch guards on the houses of people with smallpox. So you can do it, but you have to decide that's what you're going to do. Once you do that, then you have a foothold on getting this actually contained. One of the things we really need is far better surveillance. We know both numerators and denominators are pretty poor. With the numerators are lots of people that, are, that die and that it's called pneumonia or influenza. And it's probably a coronavirus, but you don't know that because we don't have specifics. But denominators are even worse. We simply don't know what percentage of the population is immune. And when I've suggested in this in the past, the pushback I get is you'd have to test so many people just to find the immune people that it's not worth it. Well, Gallup can take 2,000 people and do a survey and tell you how millions are going to vote. There's no reason we can't be this good in, with uh, doing a survey and figuring out what is the background immunity level right now. And then do surveillance on the families of people who have had a person sick or who has died with coronavirus. In those families, it's not going to be 1% or 2%. It's going to be 10 or 20 or 40%. That's where you can get the people right back to work. So I think we have to have a lot more courage to go after containment and not just wait to see what happens. Tony, does that make any sense to you? Yes, and I'm going to defer to your expertise on that one. I don't think I have much more to add, quite honestly. That's, uh, that's well, it's well said. I know there has been a lot of um, energy into, into testing to figure out who's, you know, who's already built up immunity to it. And, you know, I know we even had discussions among coworkers and, and family that said, you know, geez, three weeks before we had a you know, a known, a definite known case here, I had a pretty bad respiratory illness and my, my flu test was negative and it was probably just some virus. And it, you know, it could very well have been that we, 
I think the case is most likely that we have had more people who've already been exposed, been through the illness, and are now on the other side of it than we realize. But it's just because of lack of testing that we don't know for sure. Well, the pushback I get on this is, but we don't know they're immune just because they have antibodies. And so I say to people, I, I know that's true, but what does logic tell you? And people with antibodies probably are immune, at least until we have a mutation. And that right. could happen. Right, that's the, right, exactly. How about vaccine? Do you, is a vaccine, there, there are many different coronaviruses and we haven't yet developed a coronavirus vaccine against any of those. Does the medical community feel that a vaccine is realistic or how far out would that be? No, I think they uh, really have a lot of confidence that this is realistic. I think they haven't developed them for SARS and so forth because they were able to contain this so easily without a vaccine. This is so different that there are many people working on it. And I think that uh, there will be a vaccine. And uh, so the question is, what do we do between now and, and a year and a half from now when we have a vaccine available? And there are things we can do. See, I think we're going to have a treatment in six months. I, mean, I think this is a good possibility. There's even here at Emory, we have something called the EIDD 8210, I think it is, a uh, treatment that has worked with uh, SARS. So it's all worked on a coronavirus. And they're very excited about this could well be the, the treatment for this disease. So if we pushed all of these things, and when you think of how much money we're actually spending already, to do a full court press on containment, which also gives employment to people, uh, it's just, it shouldn't be out of the question at all. Do you, this is, I'm, I'm just curious, um, both on a national and a global level and a local level, what's the biggest challenge that we face? Is it the testing? Is it the vaccine? Is it the, um, different voices that we hear, you know, about what, you know, what is the truth about this? Um, what's, what is the biggest challenge that we're facing with this particular virus? Well, I would say that the answer to your question is yes to all of those things. <laughs> I mean, they're all very, they're all very challenging. Every one of those things. I think that, um, sort of on the front lines of things, it's, it's testing, it's, you know, it, things would be so dramatically different if I could get a test result back in an hour versus what I'm currently waiting, which is four, five, six days. And so, so if you think of when we, we have resource shortages with our, our PPE and things like that, well, geez, if I know someone needs to be admitted to the hospital for pneumonia, but I don't know if, they may have COVID-19 or not, until that test is back in five days, I have to treat them like they have this virus. And so you're just burning through, burning through, burning through uh, PPE. Versus if I could say, you know, within an hour, hey, no, we know this person tested negative, we can treat them like a run of the mill pneumonia in the hospital. Um, it changes everything. It changes the type of room they have to be in in the hospital. It changes the level of you know care they need from providers and who needs to be involved and so that frontline testing uh, at least for us I think is probably one of the biggest challenges and, and, and I often tell students the first lesson in public health is know the truth and if you don't have testing you don't know the truth and so you're always just a little bit lying before you were born and one of the first things I was involved with was the uh, famine in Nigeria during the Biafran Nigerian Civil War. And this was in the 60s. It started in July of 1967. And it was a terrible famine with millions of people dying. And I went as a deputy field 
uh, coordinator for the International Committee of the Red Cross. And then I became interested in disasters. And if there's one lesson to be learned in disasters, it's you have to have one person in charge. So that's, that's uh, the, the number one thing. And then I tell people the very best decisions are made with the very best science, but the very best results come from the very best management. So we have to be able to make decisions based on science and we have to have results based on, on management. And it's been very chaotic in this country. I mean, it's an embarrassment because we think of ourselves as being a country that knows how to manage. I mean, this is what the business people are all about. We know how to manage things. And then we get faced with a disaster and we just seem to lose all the rules from the, from the past. So if I would have to list what are the barriers right now, the first one is that we don't have that one person in charge that you can go to. Number two, there's no way to get around treatment is absolutely essential. You can't go off on other things when you have people that are dying. And so treatment with all of the necessary protective devices, the reagents, everything would be second. And then I think we have to improve surveillance so that we know where the virus is, uh, who is, who has the virus at this time, who do we have to then protect, who do we have to put into quarantine, who do we do secondary quarantine on, who had contact with those people, so that if they come down with symptoms, you already have them quarantined. So the whole surveillance uh, uh, mechanism and then uh, what I said about slowly opening the spigot so people get some hope that you do it safely, that you're getting the right people out, out uh, working. Mm -hmm. um, the containment thing is very interesting because with Ebola, this was the problem. It was so overwhelming. You, you may know this story and you may not, but WHO does have problems, and the president has hinted that he might take away funding from WHO. And we've had this before in the United States that the government has threatened to take away funding. Years and years ago, the U.S. did not pay its dues. And I wrote an op-ed piece, and I quoted Dolly Parton, who said, you'd be surprised how much it costs to look this cheap. And I said, someday we're going to find out how much it costs to look this cheap. 2014, we saw that with Ebola virus. And first thing that happened at WHO is a fight between the headquarters in Geneva and the African regional office, who would be in charge. We helped set up WHO in a way that the regions had so much power that they could undercut Geneva. And that's what was happening. The only thing they could agree on was not to call in CDC because they knew that there would be a lot of good publicity when they contained this. But no one had ever seen Ebola get into an urban area before. And suddenly they couldn't control it. But it got into Lagos, Nigeria, which few people realize the biggest city in Africa, biggest slums, everything, and it was contained. And why was it contained? Because there was a cadre of epidemiologists trained by CDC who immediately went out and found the people who were sick, all of their contacts, monitored them every day with temperatures. It was a very intense thing and they stopped it in Lagos. So that's the kind of, uh, of thing that we, we uh, need now. It's labor intensive, but uh, it has to be done. The, one of the things you asked was uh, about a second wave. I would absolutely expect a second wave of this because we're dealing with only a few percent of the population, as bad as it is, only a few percent of the population actually immune at this time. And so there's no reason why, it, even if it doesn't mutate, why it won't come around again because 
we have so many people susceptible. If it mutates, that makes it even worse. But uh, I think a second wave is very likely. I think that's uh, that's most likely the case as well. And I, I think that's why our our governor just decided that, you know, even though in Washington our our numbers are actually looking better in the terms of uh, how many new cases we're having each day. Uh, but, you know, you get to that point and, okay, what you get to mid-May and everything's looking great. So then you send kids back to school to, you know, mix around for two weeks and then you're going to have this like second wave. Uh, and and as as you've mentioned earlier, that's why it's the, you got to open the spigot gently when you start getting things uh, back into play because if you just suddenly open the floodgates, you're going to be right back to where where we are. Yeah, yeah. And, and the only difference will be maybe we have more protective gear by that time because people are concentrating on that. There is a um, scholarship or a, no an annual lectureship in surgery at the University of Washington that was funded by a doctor who once had lived in Colville, where uh, Anne's mother used to live. And uh, he became interested in medicine, but before the University of Washington was there, he went to Chicago. And that's where he went to medical school. Have you ever read the book, Boys in the Boat? Yes, love mm -hmm. that book. You may remember 1936 that they made a trip to Berlin, stopping in Chicago, and they were hosted by a doctor there overnight. This is the guy that uh, lived in Colville, and he endowed the lectureship at the University of Washington. His brother ran a store called Barman's, and this was right next to where I used to work at a pharmacy. The Strauss family became important in the University of Washington Medical School also. So all this history gets intertwined. Mm -hmm. wow. And when you're my age, you've lived through much of it. What would you tell our, our employees, our clients, what would you tell just our, our people? What's the best thing they can do to protect themselves and their, their families in the coming weeks and months? I would just say um, that we have seen the success of, of this distancing. I hate social distancing as a term because actually socially, we are connecting with more and more people, it's just different ways, but physically distancing, uh, we've seen that being successful. So I would just urge people, don't go out unless you have to. Uh, minimize your, you know, minimize your trips anywhere out of the house. If you know people who are medically fragile or older and you can help them get their groceries and bring them to them, or you can order groceries to be dropped off in your car, things like that, those things help. I mean, we've seen a dramatic drop in all infectious disease right now because of these measures. And so, um, to, to stay to stay safe and to stay healthy, honestly, that is tops. And then just the basic stuff that your mom taught you, right? Wash your hands on a regular basis. And, um, and I think we probably will see some um, uh, benefits in society if, of people wearing masks when they are out and about. And, and as you know, that doesn't help you at all, but it helps those around you. And um, so some things like that. But I think the main thing is just, Staying, staying as much in your home and your yard as you can. I agree with Tony that this is going to change the way people operate. It's this physical distancing is not only good for this disease and others, it's actually, we're now finding out, good for the climate. And these pictures you see of New Delhi where you can suddenly see things clearly that have been cloudy for so long because of, of the, uh, the smoke and the diesel and, and so forth. Uh, it, it changes the way we see the world, the way we interact with it. And it's going to improve so much this distance learning. And this is good for global health because uh, we've all been, I think, just a little bit hesitant 
to get into distance learning when you actually could get people to come here instead. But we're going to become more comfortable with this. We're going to do more long distance telemedicine that we're going to actually look at blood slides from Africa in real time and diagnose malaria and, and, uh, and other things. So I think that people need to develop some new interests when they don't physically get together. And it affects people in different ways. Uh, our son Robert was just saying yesterday that a friend of Ella's, our granddaughter, uh, came uh, yesterday unannounced because she wanted to surprise Ella. And they stated they practiced dis uh, distances. But Ella was so overwhelmed that for 10 minutes, she could not talk. She just sat there. And then, so it, it changes everything. And it may make relationships even more valuable uh, in the future. But uh, it, it's uh, truly a, a game-changing episode that we're going through that you can't think of another time like that. People often refer to this as equivalent to the 1918 flu, which killed more people globally and in this country. But you know, I was talking to, or I was uh, texting with my cousin Ro, and I said to him, my dad used to tell me about the 1918 flu, but only if I asked questions. My mother never talked to me about it. And he said, that's interesting. Neither one of my folks ever talked about it. So here you had an event of that proportion and somehow it was forgotten fast. This is not gonna be forgotten fast because no one's gone on with life as usual. As I mentioned, we have seen um, a significant decrease in pretty much all infectious disease presentations in the ER. So influenza, rather than its natural little decline that it usually does, it, it just fell off a cliff when we started all this physical distancing. Um, your typical stomach flus are not going around like they usually are because people are, you know, they're isolating. So, so all that is, is what it is. I just want to tell people that there are still good reasons to go to the ER and I'm not trying to drum up business, but we have also seen, I know here locally and I know elsewhere uh, in, in the country in the world, people who really should be in the, in the ER. They should be there for chest pain. They should be there for a stroke. And they're not doing that. They're staying home because they're scared of potentially contracting this novel coronavirus. And, and I just want to assure people that every hospital has measures in place to keep every patient safe and if you're having things that you think you should be in the ER for, you should go to the ER. That's a, that's a good point. And, and one other thing I might add is uh, people will probably change their hand washing procedures. And uh, I mentioned that my internist gave a, a talk by Zoom last week on, uh, on plagues. And he had me go over his slides ahead of time. And one of them was a slide of, of uh, Semmelweis. And he called him the father of hand washing. And I said to him that uh, I started wondering if that was really true. And I found that Oliver Wendell Holmes Sr. wrote a paper in the early 1840s before Semmelweis on just that question. And he came to the same conclusion that it was the doctors that were spreading something to pregnant women causing peripheral fever. And then I went back and found an even earlier paper by Alexander Gordon, published in 1795. It comes to that same conclusion. And you know, this is before germ theory was understood. And I don't see how these people saw through the fog to put this together. But Gordon's paper actually apologizes to his patients because he said, I don't know what it is I spread, but I know something was coming from me to you that caused your illness or your death. 
And so hand washing is not that old, but it is old. And a study just a few years ago showed that only 50% of doctors in the United States actually wash their hands between patients, 50%. In Africa, it was about 33 or 35%. And so this is gonna change the way we do this too, I think. Yeah, I'm sure you wash your hands, Tony. Oh yes, oh yes. Where, what's, the, what's the most commonly missed place on a hand when people are Probably the thumbs. Thumbs. All right. You heard it here. Tony, is that right? Yeah, it's those creases, you know, where your fingernail uh, kind of goes in on the sides of your fingernail there and under your fingernails and those, yeah. Yeah. Bill, what's the best prank you ever pulled? Oh, my goodness. Who, you know, um, if I would be president, I would say, uh, that's not a good, nice question. That's an ugly question. So, the, you know, pranks get rated different ways. And for me, uh, a prank that gets someone else blamed is very important. Number two, a prank where the person that you pulled it on never suspects you. That's very important. And there's one prank that uh, I played with, with my brother, Dick, that I waited 50 years to tell the guy what we had done. And this is when we worked at the pharmacy in Colgo, Colstead's Pharmacy. And if you sell magazines, the ones that aren't sold, you send back for credit, except you don't actually send them back. You just pull off the covers and send the covers back. So it reduces shipping charges and so forth. So we had all the magazines we wanted with, without the covers. And over and in those days, postcards were one penny. And so we bought 300 postcards and we spent night after night going through these magazines, finding free samples or free this and that. And we would fill out a postcard with Jim Colstead's name on it. And we waited and sent them all in at one time. It took about a week before the first replies came back where he would say, I wonder where this came from. And then the volume increased. And there was one day when the post office came with an entire mail bag of mail for him. And of course, I mean, we hadn't foreseen all the implications. He had to go through everything because his real mail was in there also. He never figured it out. 50 years later, I told him. <laughs> I can't thank you both enough for your time. This has been very educational and, and I appreciate it so, so very much. Do you, either of you have any final COVID thoughts? <laughs> Is that what we're going to call them now? COVID thoughts? COVID thoughts. <laughs> yeah. I like the background for both of you. The pictures behind Tony, the musical instruments behind you. And, uh, you know, Max lived with us for a year and a half going to school. He got me back playing the guitar. Every day we played together. Uh, and he I love it. Again to California and uh, it's hard to keep that up alone. You just have to play with someone. Well, maybe we should do that via Zoom sometime. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, Ann, thank you so much. Bill, thank you. It was nice to uh, get to chat with you. Appreciate it. It's good to meet you and, uh, uh, and stay safe. Thank you. You as well. Okay, thanks.